Hi, it's now time to talk about the materials and methods section of your thesis. Most people wouldn't exactly consider this the most exciting part of your thesis and okay, it's true, you don't need to be terribly creative about that. So it's something that you can do if you feel a little tired and still want to get something done. Then the materials and methods section may not be the worst choice. But still, that's not to say that you're going to be sloppy about that. You still need to be very careful about assembling that section in a complete and readable way. So the idea of the materials and methods section is that the reader should be enabled to reproduce your experimental results when necessary. So you need to give enough detail to the reader that the reader could now reproduce your experiments. So usually the materials and methods section starts with the material that you have been using, the materials. And what you see in most theses is a very long and a very boring list of things that have been used in uh, someone's experiments, you know, it states for all the materials and maybe for the sodium chloride, what company you've bought it from and what the catalog number was. For my personal taste, you could be a bit more selective about that. You know, there are certain materials where it really makes sense to not only state where you bought it from, but even what catalog number and what lot number has been used. That's true if you're talking about enzymes or about antibodies. Such materials can vary a lot from one lot to the next and it can really make all the difference for the outcome of your experiment. So in such cases it definitely makes sense to list exactly where you got it from and even what the lot number was. Whereas for my taste you could be more generous with other materials that you can really buy at any corner in a similar uh, quality. But that's something that you could discuss with your advisor first. How detailed he or she wants you to be even for materials that are unlikely to vary a whole lot whether you buy it from this or from that company. So that's the list of materials. And then, more interestingly, you continue with the methods that you have been using. So the idea is that the methods should be described in a way that an experienced user could reproduce your results. So experienced user means that, you know, absolutely routine methods are probably known to the person. So, at least in my opinion, you wouldn't need to explain in every detail how you were uh, pouring an agarose gel, for instance. Although some advisors want you to do that. So again, talk to the person, but if it's my students, I tell them to be quite brief about very commonly used methods and there you could just refer to the literature, preferably to the original literature that described that method first, but then be done with it. So it's brief with reference to original literature. However, in quite a few experimental works there have been certain methods that are quite unique to your thesis. You may have developed them further or you may have been using them in a different way from what everyone else does. In such cases, I would suggest that you do this in a complete fashion, that you describe very carefully every step that you did. And maybe you even want to describe the pitfalls, things that went wrong initially, and then you describe how you still got them to work. So in this case, complete for unusual methods. And in such cases it certainly doesn't hurt to include a figure, maybe a drawing or, e or even a picture that you took with your camera from an unusual experimental setup. So remember to include a figure or figures when describing such methods. And in that way you can really make the materials and methods section a very interesting chapter to read in your thesis. However, let's now move on with the discussion section of your thesis. Thank you.